When I was 15 years old, my mom told me that we were going on vacation up to the mountains to stay in a hotel. And when we were there, she said, hey, there's a nature outdoor school down the street. Do you want to go look at it? Like, it's a camp. And I was like, sure. So I went and looked at it. They took me on a tour, and while they were taking me on a tour, my mom was in the office talking to the administrator. And um, when we were in the dorms, I said, I want to go back now. And the girl who took me on a tour took me back to the administrative office, and my mom was gone. And I said, where's my mom? And they said, she left, you're staying here. And I was like, no, I'm just looking. There's a huge mistake. There's been a misunderstanding. I have to talk to my mom, let me call her. And they were like, you can't use the phone. There's no phone. And that's when the nightmare began. One of the reasons I'm speaking out right now is because I had a plan. And she I wasn't going to see 2021. And when you're at that point in life, you just don't that's care so anymore. <laughs> so that's where I'm at. Dirt. I just don't care so anymore if anyone, anyone you know, once again, I was afraid to speak out because people once wouldn't again, believe me. They would think I was lying. All these things. Well, you know, when you're at a point in your life where you literally just don't care anymore, I think that she probably had flashbacks it's easy to it was like reliving that do nightmare. scary things. And all of that, I think. So the thing about for-profit private sector residential facilities for kids is that, first of all, they claim to be qualified. Um, and that's the first problem, because then... You parents believe then what they're saying. Then, no matter what you tell them, they will go ahead and tell you that your child needs help. That's their professional opinion as qualified people, that your kids need help. What that does is instill fear. And then the parents, you parents, think, oh my gosh, what can we do? And they tell you that they can help and they're the only ones that can help. So parents, they start brainwashing you from the get-go. Beware. I notice that you're struggling with an out-of-control teenager. Bless your heart. Why don't you step into my office here for a minute? Let's talk. Try will kill this trap. The troubled teen industry makes so much money because scared and frightened parents are a really easy group to exploit. And their already bad kids are a very profitable commodity. The troubled teen industry is literally made up of a bunch of private prisons for profit, for kids. So the difference between post-traumatic stress disorder and complex post-traumatic stress disorder is that PTSD arises from a single event, like a car accident, for example. And CPTSD arises from either a series of traumatic events or one prolonged traumatic event. And I have complex PTSD because I was at CDU for three years and was traumatized repeatedly. So you know how you always think that you have to actually be qualified and educated and have a background check to work with kids? Well, that's actually not true. There's an entire industry, the troubled teen industry, 
and there are no background checks. There is no uh, requirement of education or credentials or qualifications. There's a lot of pedophiles working with children in the troubled teen industry, and it's really easy for them to get jobs there. The entire industry is not regulated and there's no oversight. So it's perfectly legal for them to lie to parents and then abuse their children for very, very, very large sums of money. It's gross. Are you aware that there's an entire industry in this country of abusing children for a profit? So one of the biggest components of effective brainwashing is keeping your subjects isolated. That means isolated from friends, isolated from family, isolated from media, um, <laughs> music, TV, <clears throat> everything. Um, the most important ingredient actually probably in effectively brainwashing people is absolute complete and total isolation I am absolutely not hung up on my story but I am telling it in an effort to affect real change on a federal legislative level there is a group and there's hundreds of thousands of us that are telling our stories and finally for me after 35 years speaking the truth about what happens at these places that are still open today i'm not hung up on this because i'm my own worst enemy i'm not hung up on it at all i'm trying to affect real change and people who are quiet don't do that Like I've said many times, this is a really long, complicated, strange, bizarre, crazy story to tell for people who don't have a reference point because it's just crazy. Um, but it's time that we start talking about it and breaking code silence. One of the biggest rules at these places was you do not talk about your experiences. Um, and if you do, you're in trouble. So it's just time for me to start telling my story. Um, and I'm doing it in an effort to create real change. For example, regulation in the troubled teen industry. So you're saying that because I was a bad kid, by the way, there's no such thing as a bad kid. I deserved to be physically, psychologically, and sexually abused and tortured. That's what I'm understanding. That I deserved to be physically, psychologically, and sexually abused and tortured because I was a bad kid. So bad kids deserve that stuff. So bad kids deserve to be abused and tortured in every way. Is that what I'm understanding? Am I, am I, am I hearing you right? Is that what's going on? So I just wanted to say that um, as a result of the PTSD that I have from CDU, um, I often struggle with suicidal ideation and suicidal thoughts and I just wanted to let all of you know that in the last five days since I started telling my story and sharing it with all of you, I haven't had one single suicidal thought cross my mind at all, ever. And um, it's nice to feel like um, I'm being heard and listened to and believed. And I think it's about time. And I'm really happy for all of us and thank you guys so much for your support yeah I didn't do anything to deserve to be sexually and physically and psychologically abused and tortured 
Okay. So the brainwashing process is you isolate people from everyone and everything. You attack their identity and break it down so they are not who they think they are. You make them feel bad and guilty about everything they have been and done and thought and felt. And then they break down and then you offer them some hope. You be nice to them, maybe you give them a hug. They, they think that's the greatest thing in the world that you've done this kindness for them. At this point, they're so broken. Then they offer you a solution to your brokenness. And at Sidu, they did this through raps, profits, wilderness trips, and workshops. I'm so glad that you said this. Um, it's a huge misconception. This didn't just happen a long time ago. This is happening right now, today, as I do this. Sometimes when I'm trying to explain Sidu or raps or profits or workshops, um, it's hard because whoever I'm talking to will often say, why did they do that? That doesn't make any sense. Why would anybody do that? It doesn't make any sense. And all I can say is that it was horrific and abusive, sexually, physically, mentally, psychologically, and that it doesn't make sense. But um, this industry found a way to exploit parents who didn't know what to do and make a buttload of money off of them by abusing their children. Um, you can't make sense out of nonsense. For years and years, um, since I was 19, I've been having nightmares. Uh, sometimes it's nightmares that I'm in wraps. Um, sometimes it's nightmares that um, I'm my current age, but I'm there and I can't get to my son. Um, the nightmares are all really crazy, and sometimes when I wake up from them, I'm drenched in sweat, I'm gasping for air, I can't breathe, and it might take hours or sometimes even days for me to snap out of it, and sometimes I wake up not knowing where I am and thinking that I'm there, and when that happens, it usually lasts about five minutes. Yeah, wraps are the stuff of my nightmares. I did not do anything to deserve to be sexually, physically, and psychologically abused and tortured. That's called victim blaming, and it's bad. Because I disassociate myself from my experience at CDU, I sometimes have to look at it from the perspective of my own child. Um, and so I want to talk about the sexual abuse that I experienced at CDU. And the only reason I could see it right now is because I'm not looking at it from my own experience. I'm imagining if my son was experiencing what I did and if I think that's okay. So um, I was in denial that there was any sexual abuse there for a long time, but in fact there was, and I'm going to start talking about what that was like. I am in no way, shape, or form addicted to my own misery. What I'm doing is being an advocate for the tens of thousands of children who are experiencing the same thing right now that I did many years ago. And it's happening. There are children being psychologically, mentally, emotionally, physically, and sexually abused and tortured for billions of dollars a year in this country. My speaking out about that is absolutely not being addicted to my own misery. It's called activism, and I care about the kids 
that this is happening to right now, and I'm speaking about it in an effort to affect real legislative change. Activism. Since I've started sharing my story, um, I feel like it, even if it if it helps one person in any way, even if it helps one parent not send their kids to one of these places, or you know, even if it helps one person uh, come to terms with what happened to them, um, it's given me something to live for right now. And in a way, and for the first time in my life, I'm actually looking forward to the future. And I just want to thank all of you who have um, heard me and believed me. Thank you. I do ignore the hate, but I just want to clarify that the reason I respond to those kind of comments is because I think they are excellent opportunities for me to educate and provide a little bit of a different perspective. Um, I've heard this my entire life, <sighs> that it was my fault and all that stuff. So I'm used to hearing it and I don't take it personally, but I do use it as an opportunity to educate and raise awareness. Um, and so those hateful responses, I, I use them to my advantage and um, an opportunity. It just occurred to me that because I was at CDU for three years and I went through the entire program, um, and it was so long ago because I'm like a hundred years old, my experience is actually very valuable um, in terms of speaking out and breaking code silence and talking about what these places do to the kids that are there. And I always thought my voice didn't matter, but actually, I think because I was at CDU so, so long ago, and for so long, I think I do matter. And I think my information and experience is valuable. So even though my mom is the one who uh, took me there and left me there without telling me, um, I was actually ordered to go there by a Santa Barbara County family judge. And... He um, ordered me to go to Sidu. And one of the problems with these places is that they have therapists and judges in their pockets across the country, which makes this federally funded for profit institutionalized child abuse. And that's why we all organized and we're all starting to tell the truth about what happens at these places because it's a for-profit private sector. Nobody's held accountable. And uh, so that's why I went there. A judge sent me for drinking. Sorry, but this is absolutely a nationwide standard. Absolutely for schools in the troubled teen industry that market themselves as high quality therapeutic boarding schools. This is absolutely the nationwide standard. This is a billion dollar industry. <laughs> this is absolutely the nationwide standard. And when you say it's not, you're invalidating hundreds and hundreds of thousands of us that are speaking out right now. <laughs> against it. You're accusing us all of lying. 20 year olds to 70 year olds and everyone in between. We're not all making it up. We're all verifying each other's stories. 
absolutely the nationwide standard. Just like any cult victim, um, it was really hard for me to come to terms with and realize that Sidhu had lied to me and that I had been lied to and I believed it. And, you know, um, it's really hard to swallow that realization. And, um, you know, I think it's also really hard for some of our parents to kind of swallow that realization that they were also tricked and lied to and manipulated for a profit. And Sidhu did a really good job of brainwashing all of us. And we're breaking code silence because it's time. Not all survivors are supportive. I just had a survivor tell me that the abuse I suffered at SEDU was my fault because I didn't beat up the staff members. I, I just, I was a child. I just don't even understand. Anyway, survivors, let's support each other. And let's practice having empathy and compassion for those who are still brainwashed. And the abuse has been so normalized for them for so long that they can't even see. Yeah, let's support each other and have empathy and compassion. Cool. Took me a really long time to get ready to make this video. Almost 50 years of suffering and hating myself is how long it took me to get ready to make this video. I wondered for so long who I was going to make videos for. And then I realized I make them for me because I'm bored and I don't have anyone to talk to and I don't have any friends and family. And I'm all alone all the time. So I'm making these videos for me and who am I talking to when I'm talking to you? I'm, I'm talking to me because I'm the one who's going to watch them. And I do have like two fans. I have two hardcore diehard fans and to you two, what up bitches? been really hard since the documentary came out. I don't know what happened. It hella triggered me. I've been crying all night. See how puffy my eyes are? I'm having a really hard time processing all of this and I keep feeling like I should just take down all my videos because I'm so bad and horrible and ashamed and Aaliyah won't let me. So at Sidhu, grown men would sit across from me when I was 15 years old. They would yell and scream in my face very aggressively and force me to describe every sexual experience I ever had. Then they forced me to yell and scream at the top of my lungs how much of a dirty slut and a whore I am. And then that same man would have me come over and sit between his legs on his lap while he rubbed my back. Yes, sexual abuse did in fact happen at Sidhu. I've been bullied and shamed my entire life as a result of the abuse that I suffered at Sidhu in the troubled teen industry. And that's just... B.S. You are obviously not an activist, but I am, and I care more about helping kids than I do about being upbeat for your benefit. Have you ever eaten so many gummy bears that, like, your poo is a giant gummy bear poo? Me neither. By the way, even though I'm almost 50, 
because of what Sidu did to me, I am literally in a state mentally, psychologically, and emotionally of arrested development at 15 years old. So for all intents and purposes, uh, my interactions with the world and my responses to things are very much like a teenager because I literally stopped growing like normal people do. Um, they attacked my identity, they brainwashed me, <laughs> you know, and that lasts a really long time. But yeah, I'm pretty much a 16 year old in an old woman's body. It sucks. I always wanted to be a robot. And then I realized that Sidu turned me into a robot. So I am a robot, just not the cool kind. So I also just wanted to share that I actually had another Sidu nightmare last night. Um, I woke up this morning from a nightmare that I was um, in a wrap and. Um, <laughs> And I was being screamed at, but then they said, you know what, we've talked to you enough. We're done with you now. We're moving on. And it was really frustrating because this also happened in real life that I really honestly truly was doing my best and thought I was doing what I was supposed to be doing. And I was getting it wrong. Um, and so I woke up with that feeling. The horrible part is that it disoriented me and confused me, but for no good reason, because I wasn't doing anything wrong. I'm actually really glad you said this because you make a good point and a lot of people probably think it, and it's not true. Things have not changed since I was a teenager in the troubled teen industry. Right now, there are, in fact, 20-year-olds all the way up to 70 year olds who are coming out right now and publicly speaking up, breaking code silence in an effort to raise awareness that in fact, this is happening. It happened then, it's happening now, and we need to do something about it. For-profit child abuse is disgusting and we shouldn't be doing it. This is a billion dollar industry. Yeah, for profit child abuse in this country is a billion dollar industry. It's disgusting. I will absolutely never, ever stop talking about what CDU did to me and to thousands of other kids because they are still doing it. And these places are abusing and torturing children for billions of dollars a year in this country. It's disgusting. They get shut down and they go pop up somewhere else with a new name and do the same thing over and over. There's no federal legislation that is designed to regulate this industry. And so they are able to get away with whatever they want, and they are, and they have been for decades. They are making billions of dollars a year torturing children and ruining their lives. It's unacceptable, and none of us are ever gonna stop exposing the truth. So in order for me to have um, started to put together Sidu, my past, and my present self, in order for me to have had that click and, and start putting that together for myself, a number of things had to be in place. Um, and the timing had to be just perfect. So. Um, for example, I had uh, completed a lot of college when Aliyah asked me that question that changed my life. I'd completed a lot of college, so I'd taken a plethora of economics classes and critical thinking classes. And between those two things, it really laid the foundation for me to finally be able to understand 
what Aaliyah had been trying to tell me all along. It is ridiculous to think that because one day I made some TTI videos that I spend all my time wallowing on TikTok. That's ridiculous. I also paint. So even though Sidu was what feels like a hundred years ago, it still affects me today every single day and um, in a lot of ways, but one of them is that I have a really hard time interacting with people. I haven't been able to keep a job for more than three to six months my whole entire life. I respond to everything that happens that makes me the slightest bit uncomfortable with a trauma response. So I respond to events that are happening that have in my body somehow triggered prior trauma and then I respond as if that trauma is happening even if it's not. The problem is I don't know I'm doing this when I'm doing it and I'm learning. Also, I'm basically 16, 15 years old. I have so many triggers from CDU and the PTSD that I got as a result. And I think I'm going to start talking about some of those triggers and how they affect me today because maybe I'm not alone and maybe I'm not the only one. Maybe someone else out there went to CDU or is a victim of the troubled teen industry and had some of the same experiences I did. Um, and maybe I'm not alone. I don't know. But what CDU did to me sucks, and the effect it has on me today sucks, and all the triggers I have suck. There is something about being a survivor of institutional child abuse that I wish everybody understood. And that is that Things affect us daily. Okay, I'll speak for me. Things affect me daily that might not affect you, a non-survivor, right? Because of the constant and consistent abuse we suffered over the long periods of time that we suffered it, um, our trauma response to things is not only to things that are traumatic. We have a trauma response to things that other normal people can't understand why we have this response to this thing. So if you're a supporter of a survivor and you've had a hard time understanding, just understand this. As a result of my PTSD, I often find myself having visceral reactions to things. And that's, I think, really important for people to understand about PTSD is visceral re responses. So a visceral response is um, the neurotransmitters in our brain sending a signal to our physical bodies and force a physical response. So an example of this is I went um, out on a boat a few weeks ago. I really wanted to go. I loved it. I had a great time. When I got off the boat, I was crying and I didn't know why. I realized later that my, my emotions were having a response to literally being trapped and unable to leave even though I was consciously having fun. And that fear forced me to cry. Visceral reactions, they're real. Look, I know I'm useless. Duh. That's, I mean, I just said in my video, I'm humiliated and I'm a total loser. But here's the thing, it's not my fault right? I was abused and tortured and brainwashed for three years for a couple hundred thousand dollars profit they made off doing this to me. So it is actually not my fault that the troubled teen industry broke me and so many others to the degree that we have to be on disability. I was literally laying in my bed all day crying and wanting to die. And then uh, 
Paris commented a nice note. Then I was like, fine, I'll just go look at candles instead. So I went to the store and I was crying and I walked all the way to the back and my eyes were like all blurry and I had my mask on. And then <laughs> I wiped my eyes and I looked up and this really cute piece of art was right in front of my face. So I bought it and decided not to die today. And I stopped crying. So I don't know what any of this means, but now I have this cool piece of art that says Paris. And that's the story. I got a message from somebody telling me that uh, the breaking code silence movement is irrelevant because things have changed since I was a teenager and because um, it's not a nationwide standard. It's just a couple of like random schools that are doing this. Well, that's just absolutely not true. And what you're doing when you say that is you're accusing us all of lying. There are 20 year olds and there are 70 year olds who are all verifying each other's stories right now in public, publicly speaking out against this, okay? It's not a lie. We're not making it up, okay? It happened. It's still happening today. It's perfectly legal. We're not making it up. Sing that shit. Has it go a little something like this? Lordy dotty, we likes to party. We don't cause trouble. We don't bother nobody. We're just some niggas who are on the mic. And when we rock up on the mic, we. So, honestly, I totally forgot what I was gonna say, but it was really good. Oh yeah, all these survivors of the troubled teen industry are coming out now and speaking up about the abuse they suffered. And the cool thing about that is that now it's not like, oh, look at Crystal. She's, you know, one in a million and she's just crazy in her own weird, crazy way that no one else is. And that's not true anymore. Now, it's like, I have hundreds of thousands of twinsies. And these assholes can no longer say it's just me. There's so many of us. I'm so sick. I am so, so, so sick of being me. Me. I don't want to be me anymore. How do I become someone else? Really, how do I be someone else? By the way, I'm a horrible actress. Horrible actress. But I don't want to be me anymore. I don't like being me. I don't like me. I don't want to be me. I don't want to be me anymore. I'm done being me. I love you. I love you. And, um, yeah, I love you. And you matter. And, um, if I could give you an invisible hug, I would. In fact, I am. Because I can, because it's invisible, and I love you. So, invisible hugs. And can we please lift each other up instead of trying to tear each other down? And let's stop accusing trauma victims of lying about their trauma. How about that? Yeah, that's a pro tip for life. You're welcome. I'm here all week. I'm so, I get so angry at Sidhu and what they did to me because what they did to me wasn't just what they did to me when I was there. Um, also, 
they took away my ability to uh, be a normal functional adult and have relationships and friendships and work. They took away my identity. They took away every single solitary picture I ever had from before I went there, which included pictures of my dad, who's now dead, and I don't have those. And they took so much away from me, so much, including my ability to function. The troubled teen industry is horrible and needs to stop now. Why I got sent there is irrelevant. The, this is called victim blaming. And the problem with that is there is no possible action on earth that a child a child could take that would warrant handing them over to strangers to be psychologically, emotionally, and sexually abused and be tortured for years for a profit? That's the question. Why is that okay? That's the question. The question isn't how is it my fault that I was abused at the hands of sadistic adults for a profit? That's the wrong question. What did Sidu take away from me? Well, they took away my ability to relax. They took away my identity. They took away every physical possession that I had before I went to Sidu. They took away my hair. They took away my dignity. They took away my ability to have relationships and friendships and jobs they took away everything and not just when I was there but today all these years later I'm still dealing with the consequences of everything they took from me so one of the um things about being in the troubled teen industry and being at CDU, um, and I think many survivors experience this too, is, you know, when we were there, we we're trapped, literally, physically. And so now in my life, anytime I'm trapped, even if I'm having fun or I'm somewhere where I want to be, I have a visceral reaction and it's really hard. So feeling trapped is a huge trigger and can sometimes send me into that fight or flight constant fear mode for who knows how long, days. It's hard. Over the last... um eight years that after I started realizing what happened to me at CDU and I've been I realized looking at it and researching it from a scientific technical point of view to understand what happened to me and I've never actually identified with it it was always like I was doing research on someone else and why they were the way they were and so that was I think really a way for me to distance myself from the actual experiences and in the last two days I haven't been able to distance myself from the experiences and they've become really real for me as the person who experienced them and that's different than a you know I've been approaching it all these years and it's hard and I don't like it. I'm having a really hard day today and feeling super triggered and my PTSD is like full blown 100% in effect and I probably won't remember today at all. I'm just dissociated. But I know that I'm having a lot of feelings and I'm feeling really upset about what happened to me and about the effects, the lifelong effects that that trauma and the PTSD has had on me. Um, 
to the degree of literally making it so I can't function in society as a normal, functional adult. And I'm just getting all this out while I feel it. And so I'm kind of like just posting a lot of videos and sorry. All I can say is, I hope that you don't tell the same thing to war vets who have PTSD and are on disability. I hope you don't say the same thing to them. A big part of the troubled teen industry is there are businesses, there are actual companies that um, you can call and you can pay them thousands of dollars to come into your home in the middle of the night, go into your child's room, grab them out of their bed while they're sleeping and take them to a facility. These are legal kidnapping services. They call themselves teen transport services. Um, <laughs> it's legal kidnapping and it's traumatic and it's disgusting and this shouldn't be happening and this is a huge part of the troubled teen industry that also as far as i'm concerned these services should just be abolished <laughs> this is unacceptable we shouldn't be doing this to our future i love how people think and i've never heard a military vet say this but I've heard plenty of other people say that um, I don't have PTSD because I never went to war. Well, people get PTSD in war, not only from watching their friends be blown to bits, but also from being held hostage, tortured, brainwashed. And I was held hostage, abused, tortured, brainwashed, for three years straight without a one minute break. So for all of you who think that war has the monopoly on trauma, you are wrong. So the way the troubled teen industry operates is disgusting. So um, they tell parents either that your kids won't come and so they either need to be kidnapped by a professional kidnapping service teen transport service um so they will have their kids kidnapped or the schools will tell the parents if you can trick them and get them on campus we can take them on a tour and you can leave while they're on a tour you know and don't worry we will keep them here and they will be safe so those are the two ways that the schools recommend to parents that they get the kids there either legally kidnap them which is traumatic or abandon them without telling them which is also traumatic it's horrible so let me get this straight you think that kids who were abused sexually, psychologically, physically, mentally, and spiritually, and who were repeatedly raped in some cases. You think those kids who experience that should grow up and become adults who just get over it? I don't know, it kind of makes you sound like a pedophile or somebody who thinks that abusing and torturing children for a profit to the tune of billions of dollars a year is perfectly fine and acceptable. And I don't know, maybe that just is wrong and makes you disgusting. I don't know, you tell me. So I actually was not kidnapped and taken to Sidhu. I was tricked. Uh, my mom told me we were going on vacation up to the mountains and then when we got there she said there's a little nature camp down the street that i think you'd like you want to go take a tour and see it and i was like sure so we went there and while i was on my tour um she left so i came back to the administrative office from my tour and said where's my mom and they said she left 
and my heart dropped into my stomach and I, I said, there's a horrible mistake. I'm only supposed to be looking at this place. I need to use the phone and call her. And they said, you can't. And that was when my nightmare started and I realized that I was going to be held hostage and I was trapped. Being abandoned at Sidhu has totally given me borderline personality disorder. Abandonment issues for days. Ugh. Yeah, I like all my own videos on Instagram. I have to be my biggest fan. We all have to be our own biggest fans or we'll never get anywhere. <laughs> Love yourself. Be your fan. A lot of us survivors um, have been brainwashed. And so something I like to be mindful of as a survivor that has been brainwashed and abused is um, looking objectively at, at everything. So there are a lot of things about myself that I don't like or that are weird or something. It might be a belief, it might be an action, it might be a thought process. And um, it's my job and my healing to apply the critical thinking process to every single solitary conclusion I come to. Um, just to make sure that it holds up and that it's not a result of my brainwashing because the brainwashing was BS and none of it was true. During my participation in the Breaking Code Silence movement, I have found myself doubting um, my activism a little bit sometimes. So because I've been brainwashed, that I am bad and you know, all these things. And I came for so long to believe those were my own authentic thoughts. They creep back in automatically, even if I know they're not true. So um, when I start doubting myself, like am I just a brat throwing a temper tantrum about something that happened 25 years ago? You know, these are the things I start thinking because that's how I was brainwashed. Well, then I think, is it okay like, wait a minute, let's look at the facts. Is it okay for a grown man to yell and scream at a 15-year-old girl and call her a whore and a slut and then force her to snuggle with him? No. I know you don't know this. Um, so, I'll share. I am not dwelling on it and I'm not <laughs> being a baby about it. What I'm doing is called activism. Uh, what happened to me being held hostage and abused and tortured for three years, not to mention brainwashed. That's still happening to kids today in this country. Thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of kids this minute are experiencing the same thing I did. So <laughs> what I'm doing is called activism. It's called raising awareness to try to affect real legislative change. So I learned something today that I didn't know before about the troubled teen industry. So um, I was contacted by the son of a former staff member and of a troubled teen facility. And um, after a two and a half hour conversation with him, I learned that oftentimes, likely if it happened with him, it happened with others, that the staff would go home to their families if they had them and <laughs> implement a lot of the things they did at CDU with us with their own children and their own families. Um, he mentioned to me how he still feels bad and guilty when he listens to music because she applied the same CDU rules to her family. That's really sad, and I'd never thought about it before. But it has affected my life entirely without me even knowing it. It affected my brother's lives as well. Um, I was a kid. I didn't really understand what was going on. I just want to say from the bottom of my heart, I apologize on behalf of my mother. Um, none of you needed to go through any of that. I was talking to someone yesterday and I said, oh, I remember that old staff member. I love him. He never yelled at me in raps. And every time I had a rap with him, I um, 
could breathe a sigh of relief because I knew I was safe and I wasn't going to get screamed at or spit at in my face. And the person I was talking to said, but he worked there, you know, so he was complicit. And I, and, and this inside of me, this struggle, like, but I love him so much. He's so sweet. He was so nice to me. I love him, but yes, he worked there and he was complicit in all of the abuse. So I think this is where my Stockholm syndrome comes in and I struggle. I still get Stockholm syndrome sometimes. And sometimes I even in my head make excuses for the sexual abuse that I experienced at Sidu. So for example, um, I was just sitting outside thinking about it and I thought, well, you know, maybe if I had a dad, he would have rubbed my back and that wouldn't have been bad. And I guess they were just father figures, you know, like I've been brainwashed to, to do this. And then I have to think, wait a minute though, if I did have a dad and he called me a slut and a whore and then had me come sit between his legs and he rubbed my back, I don't know, seems a little shady. But I have to remind myself all the time, I've been brainwashed and I'm Stockholm-y sometimes. And sometimes I forget. I didn't realize it until recently, but I have Dr. Phil's Stockholm Syndrome. <laughs> I used to love Dr. Phil so much, and uh, I used to watch it, and my, my boyfriend at the time, this was a couple years ago, would say, he's sending kids to some ranch, didn't you go there? And I'd be like, no, the one I went to was bad. In my mind, it was like I couldn't reconcile that he could be funding this troubled teen industry nonsense. You know, I couldn't, I couldn't, I was in denial. Like, I couldn't see it. Like, I was like, no, he must be sending them to good places, right? Like, he, how could he possibly on national TV be sending these kids to bad places? That would never happen. It happens. I know this sounds really weird, but um, as a result of what Sidu did to me, I didn't, not only did I not learn social skills, but I was absolutely taught and brainwashed with the wrong social skills. And as a result, I've, um, without knowing it until I was 38 years old, continued practicing um, and living out unknowingly all those things they taught me about communication. The problem with that is that it doesn't work in the real world, um, only at Sidu. And so one of the things I do is watch the Kardashians and I learn how to interact from them. I know that sounds weird and stupid, but it's really like as a result, I can now say to my friend that hurt my feelings. Please don't do that again. Just like they do, like normal people do instead of having to take them to a rap. It works. Then the be with you, little stupid ass. I don't give a, I don't give a, I don't, I don't, I don't give a. Look, I don't give a I'm about you or anything that you do. Don't give a about you or anything that you do. I heard you got a new man. I woke up this morning, um, gasping for air, and I couldn't breathe, and I was crying, and I felt this overwhelming, impending sense of doom and fear. And I don't remember having any nightmares. I could have had nightmares that I just don't remember. But um, this is like how my trauma from Sidu affects me every day. I know it seems really weird and complicated and hard to understand how something that happened 30 years ago can can create these, um, effects on me today. And, um, it's complex. I've studied it for a lot of years and I don't fully understand it, but I hate it. PSA real quick. 
solitary confinement is not okay. It's not okay for anyone. It's definitely not okay for children. Solitary confinement is not okay. It is irresponsible to publicly say otherwise. It's not okay. Solitary confinement for children is not okay. Any facility that uses this as a means or a method of controlling a situation or helping, which is what they're supposed to be doing, is a horrible facility. None of these places are regulated, remember. This is for-profit, private sector, very expensive child abuse. Solitary confinement is not okay. Thank you. A few tomatoes from my tomato plant. And a few more tomatoes. And a few more tomatoes. And some more tomatoes. And this is today's complete harvest of tomatoes. This happens every day at my house. There's a lot of tomatoes at my house. I have so many tomatoes. I don't even know what to do with them all. These are the crazy tomato plants that they come from. They are literally seven feet tall, taking over, growing over the fence. My tomato plants are crazy monsters. They're crazy monster tomato plants. Okay. Sitting in my room as I'm looking out the face. Something to write about. I still got some damage from fighting the White House. Just so. I fell asleep amid the flowers. I fell asleep amid the flowers. For a couple of hours. I just want to say, in case anyone's confused, um, I and all of us at CDU and likely other schools too were trained to give this response when inquired to about our experiences. It saved my life. I'd be dead if I didn't go there. Okay. That's a lie. That's a lie. Sorry. It's a lie. Okay, we were trained to say those exact words when inquired to about our experiences. That's exactly what we were told to say. And I'm so sorry, but that's exactly what you said, Ms. Drew, yesterday. Exactly. I'm not feeling very well, and there's a lot of different reasons that telling our story is hard, and one of them is because when I tell my story, it hurts my mom because she had no idea she was lied to and she was tricked and she had no idea what they were doing um or how much damage it was doing and so she feels really guilty and I feel like if I just hadn't told my story I never would have made her feel bad basically telling my story makes people I love feel like shit and makes them fight with each other and not want to talk to each other. I just wish I'd never started. I think one of the misconceptions about brainwashing is that um, you have to be a weak person to be brainwashed. And that's just absolutely not true. If you're a human being and you have a human brain in your head, you are susceptible to being brainwashed. The process is very deliberate. It's very intentional. It is, you know, takes place in a, in a chronological order. There's step one and then step two, you know. Um, 
being brainwashed is not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of being a human being and having a human brain. As a result, I've become an atheist. I've been brainwashed too many times in my life with too many different things. And it's really created a huge um, discomfort for me around religious or spiritual concepts. The problem with brainwashing is, okay, once you're brainwashed, okay, you've adopted these ideas as your own, and then you mistake them for your own original thoughts, ideas, and feelings, okay? So, like, if I've been brainwashed <laughs> that the color yellow is bad, and then 25 years later, you tell me, you know, um, you were brainwashed that the color yellow is bad. The color yellow is not really bad. My response is going to be, I wasn't brainwashed that the color yellow is bad. I think the color yellow is bad because I think that and feel it and believe it. That's my own original thought and idea, right? So the problem with being brainwashed is that you become brainwashed and don't know it. I didn't know Sidu had abused me, and I did not know I had um, CPTSD. So, until 2012, um, that was when I started putting things together. So, um, when I'm re <clears throat> when I'm reading my dreams from this dream journal I have from a long time ago, the reason I'm doing it is because it was a really important part of me to s of my process to start realizing what happened to me because I could see the nightmares. Um, I couldn't see them at the time, but later, like now, when I look back and read all the dreams I had about Sidu and what they were, it makes a lot of sense and I can see so clearly that I had PTSD. I just didn't know it. And that's why I'm gonna be sharing them. So one of the reasons I was hesitant to start telling my story of um, being a survivor of the troubled teen industry is because, you know, if my disability case doesn't go through, I'm going to have to get a job. And I thought, well, people are going to find me. If they just Google my name, they're going to find me, you know, and I, I need to be able to, like, get a job if I have to or whatever. I just felt a lot of shame about it. And you know what? I, I'm i not ashamed. It's their shame. This is a billion dollar a year industry in this country for profit child abuse. Shame. Not mine. I shouldn't be ashamed and embarrassed of what they did to me. Nope. Coming to the realization that you've been brainwashed does not automatically make the brainwashing go away. Uh, the next step, once you've identified that you've been brainwashed, is going to be identifying the thoughts, feelings, and behaviors that have been conditioned upon you from the brainwashing. Um, identifying those things can be hard because we come to think that those things are us right? We've adopted them as being our own. And so it's really, really hard to look critically and apply the critical thinking process to your own thoughts, feelings, and beliefs and actions. So just realizing you've been brainwashed doesn't make it go away. It's just the first step in then allowing yourself to identify all those things and then work hard to change them. But it doesn't go away just because you realized it. I know that a lot of you fellow survivors were um, abused before going to CDU or any troubled teen facility. And so maybe you were um, abused in different ways before you got there than you were when you were there. And so being there seemed like a respite from the other abuse. And I understand that, but that doesn't mean that what they did to us was okay. It was still abusive. None of the abuse 
was your fault or should have happened to you. But just because they seemed nicer and so we think they love us, which is Stockholm, E, doesn't mean that it's okay. It was still abuse and it's still wrong. I'm done being nice. If you don't want to watch my videos, then don't fucking watch them. Then keep fucking scrolling. Fuck you, fucking cunt. Everyone else, I love you and you look beautiful today. I want to make something really clear. There is not one of us survivors of the troubled teen industry that is acting like a victim and whining about this and crying and for no reason. It's not that we're all acting like whiny crybaby victims because of something that happened so long ago. That's not what we're doing. I, I don't understand why people don't get this. We are activists, us survivors. We are trying to affect real change to protect children from being physically, psychologically, emotionally, and sexually abused for billions of dollars a year in this country. That's what we're doing. I don't need to change my vibration. My vibration <laughs> is I'm telling my story so that we all are telling our stories so that people will know what goes on in these places and then we can affect real change and get some regulation in place through federal legislation to prevent these things from happening to kids again. I don't need to change my vibration. Um, that doesn't even make any sense. I don't have a vibration. But I definitely don't need to stop talking or, as you put it, whining about what happened to me. That's the point of this movement, is we're all talking about it so people will know it's happening and we can affect change. Unless it's normal for kids to be physically, emotionally, psychologically, mentally, and sexually abused at camp, then I wasn't at camp. So, I mentioned yesterday the pictures, uh, so Sidhu forced me to throw away every picture I had of myself before I went to Sidhu and gave me memory problems. So I don't remember my life, basically, before I went to Sidhu, and I have no pictures of it. And that was by design, and they did a really good job, and they were really successful at completely erasing my identity. They were very successful at completely erasing any identity I had before I went there. Because now I don't have pictures of it and I can't remember it. So basically, it's gone. I've been having a very, very, very hard time the last few days and I usually retreat when I'm having a hard time. And I just realized that it's confusing for us because like at Sidhu, um, we were uh, praised for wanting to kill ourselves. And we were told we were doing really good when we wanted to kill ourselves. Then in the outside world, when we want to kill ourselves, everybody tells us to be quiet, not talk about that and go to therapy and just keep it under wraps, you know? And it's confusing. And I think I struggle in that confusion when I feel this way. Anyway, just wanted to share that. Everything they did to us, the brainwashing, the wraps, erasing our identity, instilling a new one, a bad one that felt the need to confess, and then they provide salvation, and then we say thank you and we love them and they can continue to abuse us as much as they want. This whole thing, all of it, you know, <laughs> it's so uh, normal for people to go, why would anybody do this? Why? Why would anybody do this to you guys? For billions of dollars a year, frightened parents are 
unfortunately a very ripe group to exploit and their children are unfortunately very profitable commodities and none of it makes sense because you can't make sense of nonsense. I think that if anybody has a hard time smiling or laughing, you should turn on Pingu and then do what Pingu does with your body and you'll laugh your ass off. I wake up at usually 2.30 in the morning and I'm gasping for air and I can't breathe at all and I feel like I'm dying and I can't stop crying and then I can't sleep and it's been happening frequently lately but it happened again last night my heart races and this is what it's like to live with trauma every day. It's a struggle to do normal things like sleep. I told my son that maybe one of my friends will move to Oregon someday and we can hang out and then I won't be alone anymore. And he said, nobody's moving to Oregon. That's not happening. And I just want to say, I've had 47 jobs. This is my 19th town in 20 years. Um, troubled teen industry survivors, <laughs> run. Do not underestimate the flight response in troubled teen industry survivors. I smile because it's funny, but also because it's true. Uh, don't underestimate. We run. You can actually buy stock in this country, trade it on the public stock exchange in companies that literally profit from child abuse. That can't be, you say. Oh, I assure you, it is, and it very well can be, and it is. This is what I looked like when I was 15 years old, and grown men would yell and scream at me and call me a slut and a whore at Sidhu. This might sound really weird, but <clears throat> for so long I've been going through, um, the effects of my trauma in the troubled teen industry alone and I've come to somehow um, adopt as part of my identity that I'm that I am alone in my specific breed of trauma and that um, that's become part of my identity is that I'm alone and no one understands me and I've come to kind of own that and that's just not true anymore. Um, now that breaking code silence has become so big, I'm uh, learning and seeing that I'm not alone. And so it's interesting to me how that part of my identity is going to have to be rewritten. My time in the troubled teen industry left me um, living with a lot of trauma forever <laughs> and I often have nightmares and I wake up gasping for air and I can't breathe and I'm crying and the list goes on um, and so it causes a lot of sleep problems but you know it's not just the nightmares that cause the sleep problems I also I'm often afraid to even go to sleep because I don't want to experience that. And so I try to stay awake as long as possible. I know this seems silly, but I didn't realize until yesterday that not everyone in the world enters a fight or flight mode 
at every single solitary little thing that happens in their life. I do because of my trauma. And I know other TTI survivors do too, but it just never occurred to me that other people don't experience that fight or flight every single time anybody talks to them or anything happens in their life. Also, this effect that makes me look like I'm wearing makeup, I even feel bad about this because I've been brainwashed that makeup is bad. And even this filter makes me feel like I'm doing something wrong. I want to say one more thing before I wrap up for the day. Um, besides, thank you everybody for engaging with me about this very important topic of the troubled teen industry. Um, you know how you always think that like you have to get a background check to work with kids or to work in a school? That's not true in this case. And you think you have to have credentials and some education and experience in child psychology or even teaching credentials or anything? Not in this industry. It is super, super shady for a facility claiming to be a high quality therapeutic boarding school um, to not allow the children access to a phone. Like it's just shady AF, okay, for grownups to claim to be on the up and up, okay, to the degree of billion dollars a year. And yet, you know, if there was a fire or if something had happened, um, I literally didn't have access to a phone. I literally could not call the police and file a report or say something was happening. Like, I had no access to a phone. That is just shady AF is all I'm saying. Just think about it. It's shady. Getting upset about other people's healing is ridiculous. And blaming us for our own abuse because we didn't fight the staff is also ridiculous. Someone just told me that because I said that um, people who work in the troubled teen industry should be qualified, ha if they're teachers, they should have teaching credentials, if they're working with kids to the tune of billion dollars a year, they should have psychology degrees, early childhood development education, anything. And they don't have any of that. And I said that, and this person was like, well... Glad to know you're so judgmental and you're judging people. I'm not judging them because they don't have educations. I'm judging them because they're part of a billion dollar a year industry, abusing children for a profit and claiming to be something that they're actually not. They should be qualified. So me and my mom are really the only ones who like my videos. On all platforms, me and my mommy are my biggest fans. For real, my notification feed on all platforms <laughs> is hilarious. It's like, your mom loved this, your mom liked this. <laughs> Your mom shared this. It's just like my entire notification feed. Like on all platforms, like every day. It's like your mom liked this. So, I. <laughs> it's just funny. This doesn't mean I don't recognize all of you who also like my things. It's just that when I look at my notifications, it's all usually mostly my mom. But I notice all of you, and I see all of you, and I know that you like my videos too, Aaliyah. Love you. Love you all. For those of you who are wondering about my relationship with my mother, she is one of my biggest supporters in speaking out. Trying to prevent thousands and thousands and thousands of kids per year 
from being emotionally, physically, and sexually abused for billions of dollars in this country is not whining. You're gross. Is your point that I was probably a brat and deserved to be abandoned with a bunch of unqualified strangers who ended up physically, psychologically, mentally, emotionally, and sexually abusing me for three years while brainwashing me? Is that what you're trying to say? That I deserved it? Okay, this is so weird. I pulled out this basket full of journals to go through it and find the empty ones so that I could give them away and reuse them or whatever. And so I'm opening them up and I'm throwing away a couple pieces that have been written on and that's it in a journal so that, um, you know, I can gift it to someone so my writing isn't in there. And I randomly pick one out of this and I open it up and it's from October 6, 2005 and it says I dreamt last night that I was at Sidu and tied up and a girl was trying to kill everyone then I called my mom I mean like of all the things to open a journal to that's what it is nice are you saying this because only bad girls get um, held hostage and abused and physically, emotionally, mentally, psychologically, and sexually tortured for three years? Is that why you're saying this? Because that only happens to bad girls? So here we have a company, UHS, they are traded They've got all these subsidiaries. They own a lot of facilities, see? Uh, in fact, Oregon won't even let them here. They've been ordered to pay out millions of dollars. They have a long history of abuse. I'm just going to scroll through. This is just some of the legal problems. This is just some of them that... Provo has faced. Keep in mind, Provo is only one of the places, one of the facilities owned by UHS. Remember, a few picks back, there was a fact sheet, and that showed, and before that was a list of its subsidiaries. So it owns a lot of facilities. <laughs> um, a lot of what I'm showing you right now simply just applies to one, just one facility. And if you think that it happens at just this one and not all the other hundreds, you're wrong. And so here are some of the legal cases. You guys can access all of this stuff. I'll show you how at the end. Um, here are some DHS reports. Um, these are actual copies of the actual documents, um, more DHS reports. So what happens is people own stock in this company, and when you have all this negative press and you're getting all these DHS reports, your stock plummets. And then what? Hello fellow humans. So I was um, held and brainwashed and abused and tortured in a for-profit child abuse prison, marketing themselves as a high-quality therapeutic boarding school. Um, I happen to have just pulled out a written record of my brainwashing and my abuse and I have not opened these or looked at them in a hundred years. And I have a lot of them. And yeah, I have a written record of my brainwashing and my abuse.
in my own handwriting, which actually is the only reason I believe any of it happened, because I wrote it. So I found a dream journal, and I'm going to be reading some of the dreams I recorded. Um, this one is from April 3rd, 2000, and this is what it says. I had a dream that I was at a party and someone stole my Starburst candies. Kim Crodell was there, and I had to cry and scream at someone and tell them that I have had three abortions. Jason was there, and old boyfriends were there, and there were a lot of stares. Kim Crodell was my best friend at Sea-Doo. She's gone now. Um, but, yeah. Um, by the way... I didn't realize I had PTSD or that CDU abused me until 2012. So this was April 2000. This was before I even knew these dreams were a result of PTSD. I'm going through my CDU journals, so I'm going to read some pieces. Um, one thing to know is that at CDU, they taught that you had two parts of yourself. There was I and there was me. I is bad, me is good. Just very simply put. This is what it says. I makes me do things that me does not want to do, such as laugh, cry, act, or flirt. Skipping ahead some. I felt as if I would lose if I said the right answer. I thought if he asked me a question and I said me, I would be giving into his game. I call it. I got really sad also because of seeing what was happening to other people mostly. So I've talked in the past a little bit about Sidu and music and how that affected me. Um, in short, they brainwashed us. I really fell into this, that music is bad. And I'm reading some out of my journal, so here's a little excerpt. I wrote this about two years after I was there. I screamed a lot and cried. Then they played an old metal song. And at first I liked it. Then after a few seconds, it made me cry. I hated it. So before I left, they were already testing us to make sure we hated the music <laughs> and that we were never gonna listen to Metallica ever again because it's bad. Um, I still struggle with the music thing, and I've made a couple videos talking about that, but it's interesting when I look back at my journals and read something like this, brainwashed. So, the last video I made talks a little bit about music, and I've made a few talking about what Sidu did to us, but I really fell into it. Um, that they brainwashed us that music was bad, except they had a few songs that they brainwashed us with and they played over and over and over again. So right after that excerpt I just read in the last video, this is what it says. They played that song to show us how easily it is to become who we used to be. Then they played Love is Real and Everyone Smushed and we shared more. By the way, smushing is forced cuddling between staff and kids. So I hated Metallica and it made me cry, but Love is Real was okay. I haven't really gone into this a whole lot, but there was a lot of times that we actually at sea were not allowed to smile or laugh or touch anyone or make eye contact, on and on. Um, and this is one of the things I wrote in this journal. Okay, remember, their lingo is that I is bad and me is good. I covers me up by laughing all the time and by smiling. So, <laughs> the bad part of me was making me laugh and smile is what that says. And... I really, 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 like, got brainwashed that that was true to the degree that Aaliyah still has to be like, it's okay to smile, you're allowed to laugh. 
So one of the things I'm noticing as I'm reading through my sea journals is um, a pattern that the staff really were always calling me a liar and they always wanted me to be honest. And I find that really strange because I had never lied about anything before I went to sea -Doo. Like not even about stealing lipstick. Like I told the truth about that. And when I was there, I never lied about anything. But like through this whole entire journal, it's like staff keep telling me to be honest. And what they were really saying is you better figure out how to get with the program and say what we want to hear. As I'm reading my journals to you guys, little excerpts. I'm noticing that there's no shortage of nonsense in these things and they totally made me crazy with all of their nonsense and their confusing stuff that doesn't make any sense at all at all and I was totally brainwashed by all of it like no wonder I can't function as a normal adult seriously it's crazy so yeah just know that if you guys see me and I say this is an excerpt from my journal you're about to hear a bunch of nonsense. There are a lot of people who were in troubled teen facilities and they are still brainwashed and they think that it was great and it saved their life and you know, all that stuff. And I get, sometimes I get some mean messages from them. Um, the most recent one was from a girl in my peer group, so we actually went through the entire program together, and she said, quit acting like um, a victim. You're not a victim of anything, and uh, quit acting like a whiny crybaby about something that happened 25 years ago. And um, I just want to say something about that. Um, quiet people don't affect change, and we need to affect real change to protect these kids. So screw them, let's be loud. So one of the things I just wanna share about this rally in Provo, um, cause I'm about to leave and drive home to Oregon, is that um, it's a different experience to be surrounded by a group of people and be um, encouraged and um, shown a lot of love to. I'm, I'm pretty sure the last time I was in a group situation was in a rap <laughs> and I wasn't feeling encouraged or loved and I think that was just one of the most amazing things about this experience was being in a group of people and not being attacked, but being encouraged and loved. And thank you all so much for that. I love you. One of the greatest things I got from this um, peaceful protest event in Provo, Utah, um, to shut down Provo Canyon School, was um, <sighs> the reality that when I'm laying in bed crying and feeling like I'm broken and nobody understands no matter how much I explain it to them. That's not my reality anymore. Um, I have six phone numbers in my phone of people who I know understand without my having to explain anything. And that is such a huge gift for me. Um, I Like I couldn't have asked for anything else like like in terms of me personally getting something out of the event it was that i my reality is no longer that i'm alone i've been really uh stigmatized my entire life as being a bad kid or a troubled teen or a troubled adult or crazy or mentally ill and you know all these things that have been used as pejoratives to describe me by people I know um, and I just want to say bad kids and troubled teens and dysfunctional broken adults don't have peaceful protests 
all of us that were there, look at what we did. I feel every day like I'm dysfunctional. I can't do anything right. I, you know, I'm worthless. All these things, okay, that it's all the same story. But you know what? Broken, crazy people don't have peaceful protests. I just want to say that um, <laughs> for a group made up of only bad kids, um, we sure had a very effective and peaceful protest to try to shut down Provo Canyon School. And I just think it's amazing that so many of us bad kids have turned into such, even though we don't feel like it, such responsible adults that we are doing this and we're fighting for these kids and we're trying to get regulation and we are so amazing.